Wadi, this is Houston on two. We're going to get started here in about a minute after some S-band blockage. Copy, thumbs up. Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Station is ready for the event. Stanford Magazine, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Tracy White with Stanford Magazine. How do you hear me? Hello, I've got you loud and clear. How are you about oh, me? Great. It's so nice to meet you. You look great. <laughs> um, since other people are listening to this, I'm going to just introduce you a, le a little bit. This is Jessica Watkins, an American astronaut, geologist, former international rugby player, uh, Stanford alum, class of 2010. Uh, now as a member of the Artemis team, you have the possibility of becoming the first woman on the moon and possibly the first person of color on the moon, PhD in geology from UCLA, Caltech. Um, is this your first space flight? Can you hear me? Indeed, yeah. yes, it is my first yeah. space flight. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And um, you've been up how long now? Um, so we have been up here almost five months now. Five and uh, months. we'll be up here about five and a half to six. Yep. Yeah. So when you, when is your when you expected home? Uh, so right now we're looking at around mid October. Um, it's going to depend a little bit on weather. Um, we are we are going to launch the next crew. Um, so they are crew five. We are crew four, um, launching on a uh, SpaceX Dr Crew Dragon. And they will come up here and we'll have a, a few days, several days of handover where we can kind of let them know how, how thing, where things are and how we're kind of running things um, so that they're prepared to uh, be the, the team on board. Um, and then we'll, we'll head back down after a few days with them um, in around mid-October. Okay. Well, I have heard that it's your, it was your dream to become an astronaut. So. Can you tell me a little bit about how that came about and what this experience has been like for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, yes, as you mentioned, first kind of voiced um, a desire to be an astronaut when I was pretty young, um, around the age of nine. Um, and I, th I think the, the main kind of driver for that when I was um, around that age was um, I was attending an after school program um, at the Judy Resnick Elementary School. And I came home and was asking my parents about who she was and, and what um, her, her story is, was about. Um, and I think that was the first time I, I learned that you could go to space as a career. Um, and I was definitely hooked. Yeah, well, I was going to So I did hear that um, Judy Resnick was kind of a role model for you. And do you feel that you can be a role model for young kids yourself? Yeah, you know, I certainly certainly hope so. I certainly hope to be able to return the favor for um, all of the mentors and um, uh, role models that I had growing up that certainly kind of allowed me to see myself um, in, in roles that I aspired to be in and contributing in ways um, I, I aspired to contribute. So um, to the extent that I'm able to do that, um, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Um, okay. How how are you feeling physically? How how has uh, being in space affected you physically? Yeah, 
so I feel great. Um, we have an amazing team um, of, of folks on the ground who are checking in on us, um, both uh, doctors as well as um, physical trainers who are making sure that we are, are in good shape up here. Um, certainly space flight and um, long duration space flight in particular um, is tough on the body. We certainly, we know this from, from research that um, we can experience um, with without doing anything about it, um, we can experience pretty significant bone density loss and um, uh, muscle degre degradation, um, as well as other changes to um, to our bodies in terms of vision and um, blood flow, things like that. Um, so we have a set of kind of what we call countermeasures in place, um, and, and largely what that focuses on is exercise, both resistive exercise as well as cardiovascular exercise um, to help um, to help combat um, some of those effects of, of space flight. So um, with that, we work out every day. Um, we have a, a resistance machine where we can um, load up a bar and, and do squats and deadlifts and, and everything that you, you could do on a bar. And then as well, we have a uh, bike and a treadmill that we can use for cardio. And so we are, we're spending a couple of hours every day uh, making sure that we are strong and healthy and ready for return. Um, and your schedule, I, I think I heard that you get a schedule sent to you each day. It's very, I assume it's a very strict schedule. Can you tell me about that? And if you fit in rest and re relaxation, and then maybe you can start talking about your um, the the science work you're doing on board. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you're you're absolutely right. Every day um, we get a schedule uploaded to us. Um, we we see it the night before, and, and sometimes there are last minute changes. But um, every day we are we are following a schedule that helps keep everybody just kind of on the same page. Um, you know, this is the International Space Station, and it is certainly an international effort up here. And so to have a you know kind of single source document that we're all working off of um, helps keep everybody in sync. Um, and so we wait up in the morning and we start every day with um, a conference, essentially a, a, a meeting um, where we all, um, all of our different centers in um, uh, Moscow, um, Scuba, Munich, Huntsville, and of course um, Houston and Johnson, at Johnson Space Center. Um, all come uh, together to make sure that we're starting off on the right foot. We all have an understanding of what the, the day's game plan is, and then we go off and, and accomplish it. And so any on any given day, we could be doing a number of things, um, which is a really awesome part of being up here, um, that we have just so many um, different uh, things that we can get involved with. So we spend about 30% uh, of our time doing maintenance um, on the station. So just like uh, your house or, or any, any other building, um, we definitely have to um, maintain it and make sure that we are extending, doing our best to extend the legacy of, of the ISS. Um, and then the other percentage of our time, as you mentioned, is focused largely on science. Um, we are um, involved in lots of different kinds of scientific investigations, scientific research. Um, we look at uh, biology, for example. Um, we have a, we are participated in a study looking at cell biology, looking at the um, impact of long duration space flight on on immune cells um, and how they can age over time in this um, space flight environment and what we can do about that. Um, we also looking. We also um, are involved in a, a study on plant growth. Uh, so we are looking at ways that we can grow plants um, in microgravity. Um, in particular, looking at ways to do that without soil. Um, soil adds mass um, and and volume. And um, also there are, there are containment constraints as well. So looking at ways that we can, in the future, um, learn to grow plants, grow crops um, that astronauts might need on some of the um, even longer duration and further um, uh, further expeditions as we look towards the moon and Mars. Uh, so we have lots of um, interesting science, and then we also are doing technology demonstrations, um, again with an eye for um, what is to come, looking at, um, for example, a study um, called AstroRad, where we're looking at a vest that we can um, wear during a solar um, 
solar particle event that would protect us from radiation and looking into um, how that vest would function and, and the wearability of that. And then that same vest will actually be riding on Artemis One, um, on the mannequin that will be riding on Artemis One. So we'll get um, both kind of both sets of data on, on that vest that will help us understand uh, how to move forward. So, so much of what we do here on station is, is contributing to those next steps moving forward using the ISS as a test bed for future exploration. Uh, that segues nicely into you being a member of the Artemis program. And could, do you mind um, describing a little bit to people what that is and what it means to you and what the ultimate goal of the Artemis program is? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the Artemis, um, the Artemis uh, team was a, a um, team of folks from the the astronaut NASA astronaut corps um, that were kind of uh, uh, identified to help lay the foundation, set up the pathways um, towards going back to the moon and going back to the moon to stay for a long duration um, as part of the NASA Artemis program. Uh, so this program will have um, several missions. The first um, will be launching here very shortly, um, as as soon as we we uh, figure out um, the um, the quirks that we encountered um, in last uh, this last weekend, right. um, and that will go um, around around the moon, um, and then uh, then that one is uncrewed. Artemis II will have will be crewed um, and will um, go around the moon and uh, be a test mission, and then Artemis III will be um, a crewed mission that will go down to the surface of the moon. Um, and so to uh, be a part of the NASA team, the astronaut corps in particular at this time, is just a super exciting time in human space flight um, and just um, honored to be able to be a part of these um, amazing efforts. Well, it also sounds like your education has, maybe you can tell me, did you, did you choose your education to, to prepare you to be an astronaut? Possibly be able to study rocks on the moon. I, you have a, a nickname, Rock Nerd. Is that what the other astronauts call you? I think. <laughs> and I have to comment on your Stanford sweatshirt. That is really great to see. Um, so yeah, tell me about um, about your education and what your goals have been. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sure thing. Um, so yes, I I certainly um, had the idea of being an astronaut, the dream of being an astronaut somewhere in the back of my head, um, and certainly wanted to kind of keep that door open at least. Um, but honestly, um, never really thought that it was um, something that would be attainable for me and um, not something that I kind of strategically pursued necessarily. Um, it was uh, more of, of finding something that I really was passionate about and something that I really enjoyed um, and that that would also you know enable that opportunity um, if, if the the opportunity came um, and so for me um, actually starting out as an undergrad at Stanford um, I started out as a mechanical engineering major um, largely actually because I thought that that was what was required um, in order to be an astronaut. I um, hadn't done a ton of research into it, but that was the idea I had in my head. Um, and after um, about around my sophomore year, I um, really just discovered that, that that mechanical engineering was just not my passion. It was um, just not um, something that they got me out of bed every morning and, and just um, was not uh, something I was, I was really into. And so, um, I was able to um, kind of flip through the, the course bulletin at Stanford and, and found these courses that sounded so interesting to me. Um, classes with uh, titles like What Makes a Habitable Planet and uh, Planetary Materials. Um, and I said, what is, what is this? Whatever this is, I'm in. Um, and I looked up and, and it was in the Geological and Environmental Sciences uh, Department. And so I signed up for my first geology class um, and, and the rest is history. Um, I definitely fell in love um, and fell in love with the, particularly the idea of planetary geology, um, the idea of being able to study rocks on the surface of another planet um, just absolutely enamored me and still does to this day. Yeah, uh, well, so exciting that you're so close to doing that. Um, how, what would it mean to you to be the first woman on the moon? Uh, 
Yeah, you know, I, I think for me, just the the idea that um, being a part of this endeavor at this time in history um, means that I have the privilege and the honor of being able to be a part of this effort um, that you know will require the entire agency um, and then the and the support of, of the entire nation as well. And so the the notion that we are going back to the moon to the surface that we are going to put a woman um, on the surface and to know that that is um, will be one of my colleagues, one of my friends, um, somebody I know personally. Um, it's just even difficult to wrap my head around. Um, it's really exciting. Yeah, it really is. Um, okay, quick comment. Uh, I, I did read that, um, well, you you were on the Stanford rugby team, which won a national championship, um, and you scored the winning goal. Um, and tell me about what you learned about being on a team that's helpful in your current job. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. You know, you asked about uh, my how my education has prepared me um, for this this job. Um, but the other really big part of what I learned at Stanford was on the, the Stanford women's rugby team, um, and and that really um, that experience um, on the team really uh, built up a lot of the skill set that I think um, is really important in in this job, and especially up here on a mission like this. Um, the thing about rugby in particular, I think, is um, a rugby team requires uh, people of all sizes, shapes, skill sets, uh, strengths in order to be successful. Um, and the the NASA team, the the human spaceflight team, the you know inter international cooperation that is required to, to do what we do up here every day is exactly like that. Uh, we require all kinds of skill sets, expertise, backgrounds um, in order to come together, pool our resources, and do something that we couldn't definitely not do on our own. Um, and so learning that lesson um, on the rugby pitch is, is absolutely applicable um, to being able to be a good teammate um, up here on the ISS. Yeah. It, it can, well, let's go to a, one more. We're, we're running out of time, so let's go to some of the bigger questions. I'm really curious about what your living situations are like like how you stay in bed at night to sleep. Maybe you can at least tell me that. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so sleep is not an issue at all up here, at least for me. Um, we have um, crew quarters, uh, essentially kind of the size of a phone booth, um, where we, um, you know, have our, our uh, personal computers and um, uh, personal effects, as well as a sleeping bag. Um, and so we just um, get into our sleeping bag, zip ourselves up, um, and. For me personally, so some people um, like to have a restraint um, across them. So when they're on the wall, they kind of are restrained to the wall and give them the sensation that um, you know they're laying down and that gravity is is pulling on them. Um, however, for me, I actually find it very comfortable to um, just float. Um, to I so my sleeping bag is attached to the wall, but the the bottom of it is not, and so my feet um, just float up, and uh, it is uh, super comfortable, super easy to relax. Well, on that note, I've heard that you do an amazing backflip in space. Could you maybe show us? <laughs> uh, I set a high expectation, but absolutely. Okay. <laughs> oh, that was beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think we have two minutes left. Would you like to comment on why human spaceflight is important to people who may not quite understand why we spend so much money on these efforts? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think there are uh, multiple kind of more practical reasons um, that uh, sp human spaceflight is important and um, provides um, enables life to be better on the ground. Um, you know, there are the, the scientific advances um, that we that we um, can create by doing research in the microgravity environment. Um, there are the technological advances um, that we make through the process of developing technology to function in microgravity and to, um, you know, enable productivity um, on the ISS. 
there are economic um, benefits in terms of stimulating economies and industries. But I think for me, the, the most important and the most um, convincing reason um, uh, that spaceflight is important, human spaceflight is important, is the um, is a, is a bit more intangible, perhaps. Um, but the idea that uh, spaceflight unites all of us, it is um, it is the the idea of exploring the unknown, um, looking over the hill, wondering what is what is around the corner, is something that is innate in all of us um, and something that truly unites us. And so, to be able to see the International Space Station in particular as an example of um, what we can do when we. Uh, pool our resources, we can leverage our differences um, instead of letting them divide us. Um, what we are able to accomplish um, as, a, as a team and as, as one, one whole body, um, I think that is something that is really important um, to provide an example of and, and something that we can strive for in, in all of different realms. Yeah. Thank you, Jessica. It's so great talking with you. This is wonderful. Safe flight home. So great talking with you as well. Thank you so much. Go card. Station, this is Houston ACR that concludes the event. Thank you to all participants from Stanford Magazine. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.